Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, a podcast that looks at the inspiration, intention, action, and choices that you can make to bring more joy into your life, into the world, and into other people's lives. This is your host, Paula Jenkins. Welcome to episode 210. This week on the show, I'm really excited to have Kedma O oh joining me. She is a business development and business funding expert and the author of the book, Target Funding. She has experienced both homelessness and abuse in her life, and she has made it her mission to help underrepresented entrepreneurs find a way to get funding for their businesses. She's a multi-passionate, and she has focused her own entrepreneurship on two things, helping women and people of color get funding for their small business, and niching down to serve and advocate for differently abled individuals. I'm really honored to have her joining us this week. Before we get to the show, I want to wish you all a very warm welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. And always, it's such a treat to get to speak with you guys. If you want to find out more about the show, you can find the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com. And while you're there, you can find a place to sign up for my weekly newsletter where I get to share some other ideas and thoughts about each episode. And you get kind of a behind the scenes sneak peek about the show. And you can sign up for that right there on the front page of the website. You can also find show notes for this episode and for every episode on the website at jumpstartyourjoy.com forward slash Kedma is for this episode. And why would you read show notes? Well, because (laughs) there's the link to her book there and there's more information and details and some notes about the things that we talk about in case, you know, you're driving and you don't want to stop and take down notes while you're driving. While you're on the website, you can also find my cheat sheet if you want to start a podcast of your very own. I give a list of the top three tools that I recommend for podcasters, along with all the hardware and software that I recommend and use to create my own show every week. So that's another thing that you can look for there on the website. I'm really excited to introduce Kedma to you guys. I, and I really enjoy this interview with her. She's no nonsense and really energetic. And she's a multi-passionate. So you know that we're going to have a ton in common. And she has a lot of really actionable tips and thoughts on how to grow a small business that she's going to share with you guys in this episode, which of course aligns really nicely with the inspiration, intention, and action aspects of how we go about finding joy in the everyday here on Jumpstart Your Joy. I also really appreciated about how she is totally unapologetic and direct about who she is. She embraces that it's okay to be smart and sexy and... She's providing an excellent role model that illustrates that traditionally feminine qualities can provide a strong and powerful presence in a business setting. And I think so many of us kind of shrink away from that, but she really owns this and it is her choice to show up as both and own her femininity. This theme has also run through her business because she's met a lot of people who told her she wouldn't be successful in becoming a consultant and advocate for differently abled people, and she has proven them all wrong. And I just love that she stayed so true to her choices and to who she knows she is and who she wants to serve. I think you guys are really going to love this conversation and getting to meet her. Let's get on to the show. Welcome to the show. This week, I'm so excited to have Kedma O oh joining me. Welcome to Jumpstart Your Joy, Kedma. Thank you. <laughs> yes, my pleasure. So the first thing that I ask everybody is a, a little bit about their childhood and what you love most as a child or in school. What were your earliest sparks of joy? Mm. That's a very tough question, Paula. Yeah, um, I know. And I do have some guests that it's like, oh, this one's this one's not as easy for me. <laughs> yeah. Well, the reason it's not easy is if we were going to look at our childhood the movie theme, and you can go anywhere from a Disney movie to a drama movie to mm-hmm. a Western movie. I was born into a horror movie. So mm-hmm. it's not, I don't have wonderful experiences like other people may have. And my journey was quite difficult to get me to where I am today. Having said that, I what I did learn is I learned to go into a place in my mind where I could imagine things. Yes. And I realized that no matter what was happening on the outside, that nothing could take away 
my imagination on the inside. And because of that, even today, I am extremely playful. And I literally live my life as a seven year old, I have a dollhouse in my house right now, that is like the size of a table. And I kind of use the idea of a great childhood in my adult life now. I love that. And thank you for diving in with the question. And I think it's beautiful that you have then turned that from being something Yes. Difficult as a child to then embracing more of that playful side as an adult. Because I think exactly. many of us actually do the reverse, right? Like we exactly. start in a playful place and then it's like, uh, this is, yes. this is reality. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Would you like to share with the audience what it is that you do now and, and who do you work with? Yeah, well, I am extremely passionate about serving the entrepreneurial community. I'm a fifth generation entrepreneur. So that's what I do every day is I I like to say help dreams come true. And I specialize obviously in target funding, but I've worked with over 10,000 entrepreneurs over the last 20 years. So I have touched every vertical. I have worked with everyone from women, minorities, veterans, people with disabilities, Native Americans, you name it. I've worked with clients. And my current role right now is actually I just onboarded as vice president of business coaching for the largest consulting firm in the country for the home services industry. So I have the the privilege of working with everything from maid services to power wash companies, window cleaners, with an emphasis on not only building those companies, but bringing more women into those companies as the CEOs, not just, you know, not just the front line, but building them as CEOs. So that's what I do every day. That is really exciting. And I love that (laughs) focus. Yeah. How do you see that, you say, moving away from just being on the front line into more of a leadership and CEO perspective? What do you see are some of the barriers for that? Or (sighs) like, what are some of the mindset shifts that you guys encounter? Yeah. If it's not barriers that are just already out there with people. Yeah. Well, there are barriers that are specific to all entrepreneurs and small businesses scaling up, right? And really Mm -hmm. comes down to systems, right? Or there may be barriers in getting financing. You know, I always say I love my lenders, but let's just be real. Lenders have a very specific criteria. You either fit in or you don't fit in. So these are standard barriers. Employee engagement and how to create that kind of messaging. You know, these are barriers. On top of that, I think that there are certain barriers that women face. I'm not going to lie about it. And one of the biggest things that women face is this idea that they want to contribute to society. They want to be a game changer. And when you ask them to pitch who they are and what they do, there's this hesitation to say, I don't want to brag about myself. Mm, Yes. Okay. (laughs) How do we get past that? (laughs) Yeah. So here's the new thing. I'm going to mind shift and change this from now on for anyone listening to this. I termed this about two years ago because I talk about bragging all the time. And so brag stands for this. Bring repetitive, authentic greatness to the world. And if you are consistently bringing repetitive, authentic greatness to the world, you have an obligation to brag. Yes. So I am really clear about that because we have to cut through the noise and we have to be comfortable. The other thing I would speak on behalf of all women, because I am a woman, I make it really clear that I'm perfectly okay being smart as well as sexy. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't need to compromise that. I don't need to compromise femininity with the idea of wearing dresses because I feel like it with the idea of, well, now I can't be a tough business negotiator. I can be both. And I've seen this a lot in the workforce where it's almost like people feel like they have to change their entire dynamics of their DNA of who they are as they go up the ladder. And I don't think that's necessary. Oh, amen. Yes. I mean, I, so my background is, and still am a project manager for 20 years in marketing and digital advertising. And I know there was even one place where I felt like to fit in. I mean, you we can all yes. laugh about this now, but like that I had to wear literally a certain kind of makeup. Like pancake makeup was definitely what I was seeing with all the people that were above wow. me. And I did it once and I'm like, this literally does not feel authentic whatsoever. And 
like I can't exactly. do this <laughs> because it's that exactly. both the physical fitting in. I'm also tiny. I'm four foot ten, so I don't fit in anyway. But mm-hmm. like just that sense of like trying to morph myself into what the expectations were just was yep. so absurd that I love that you've kind of said like, no, we can be both. Yes. We can be authentic, and we don't yeah. have to change that up. Exactly. Yeah. Mm, that's so good. A lot of <laughs> the people that listen and that, that are kind of in the wider network here are life coaches that have oh, been in training or through training. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think one of the big things that I see having also had that path, because I'm a certified coach and mm-hmm. that's part of my story here, is that we see, ooh, I want to go mm-hmm. after this thing, but it really means I'm starting a business right? <laughs> and I have zero training in such a thing. What are some of the things that you see coming up as a woman embarks on that journey to start a business, usually for herself? Right. Um, what do you see unfold for them? Well, I think one of the things we have to realize, because I think the whole world is under this myth that the business plan is the beginning and the end of all things. And, mm-hmm. and I would challenge that every day of the week, because I think in the, the idea of starting a business, I always encourage my clients to do some kind of feasibility assessment. And the difference is, is that if you embark on this life coach experience and you do a feasibility assessment, you are essentially going to give yourself permission to look at what is feasible. Mm -hmm. Is this really possible? Can you enter into that? What does your niche look like? What is your pay scale going to look like? Is this going to work? Your business plan is just the execution. Right. Right. So we see so much. I mean, I do business plans in my sleep. So I see all these Mm -hmm. business plans coming in. I go, this is not feasible. Right. Right. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, and people talk about it all this, all the time, you have to find your tribe. Now, here's where the challenge is. Regardless of whether you're certified or not, the reality is, is that in the world of coaching and consulting, there's been a little bit of a watered down situation where the scary thing is if, if I'm talking with Paula, who's an incredible, solid, certified coach, you may be in a mainstream with a thousand other coaches that may not have your experience, but they're calling themselves coaches. Yes. Now in this mainstream, how do you go above the noise? So what I tell people is you have to go above the noise in such a way that your brand is redefined by it. Because if you just say, I'm a life coach, you're going to be in the sea of a thousand other coaches saying the same thing. And then it's hard for the community to know which one they should work with. Right. Yes. So really important to define that and then find your tribe. And what I mean by find your tribe is I don't look at people who've made a lot of money. I look at people that have the lifestyle I always want. Because I have met, Paula, so many millionaires that have children that hate them, divorces. No offense to divorce. I went through one. But right. But not only divorces, but now they're married a second, third time. And that person doesn't like them. Mm -hmm. They're not taking care of their health. And so they have a lot of money. And so what? So those are the things I really look for when you're scaling, find your tribe, clear on your mission and do a feasibility. I love it. Yeah. Cause I think the other thing with it being that there are a lot of coaches either stepping in and, and I think there's plenty of people out there that have life experience that set them up to be a really excellent coach or a mentor or someone who can consult on business. So I don't know that you need the certification per se, right? but then there's a bunch of us who have also gone through a certification process and then At the outset, I don't want to ruin anyone's ideals or where they think they're headed, but it is not an easy path to go from being one thing and being maybe in your 40s-ish and go, now I want to do something else. Right. But I'm kind of in, what is it? Is it Red Ocean or whatever, where it's like we're a little bit oversaturated at this point. true. The number of people that are going after the certification, that love a lifestyle yes. that looks like it can be done yes. from anywhere. And that, so how do you differentiate yourself as part of right. it? But I love right. the really like kind of nuts and bolts of it of going, okay, but what's the feasibility assessment? How am I actually going to make this work? Yes. Huge. And I'll give you a quick example. When I started my consulting path here in Oregon in 2001, mm-hmm. I went into a category that nobody, and even to this day, nobody's really doing. And I'll just tell you really quickly, I decided that I was going to give world-class consulting for people with disabilities, Mm -hmm. um, with the idea of entrepreneurship. And I'm telling you, my colleagues, I will never call them out. 
but they would sort of frown on me, like, why do they get them? And how are you going to get paid? And but do they really deserve world class coaching? And I, of course, nobody's going to say that to your face. But behind closed doors, this is what was going on. And I said, because I believe in it. Well, today, I am considered an expert in the disability community across every disability and not only an expert. I sat on the funding committee for vocational rehabilitation. I'm a consultant for the Veterans Administration. And believe it or not, four years after I launched that commitment in 2001, in 2005, I gave birth to my son who's autistic. Mm. So I feel like I was already in the system well before he got the diagnosis. And now I'm an absolute champion and I know how to get funding for that population of which that I'm a part of in the community. So that's an example where I went right above the noise because it's 54 million people in the U.S. that has a disability. And I, I always like to say it is the only community that you get an invitation at any time. Mm, right. Right. Because Paula, you and I could be sitting here tomorrow. Something happens to one of you, either you and I. And guess what? We're in the community all of a sudden. Right. Yes. So that's an example of how I did it to get above the noise and really show where my expertise is. Yeah. Well, and I think it is, it is interesting to just kind of, I imagine part of that's you're going with your kind of your intuition or your heart in knowing that that was a space that interested you as well. And yes, would that be yeah true? (laughs) Um, I'll tell you simply why I think it goes back to my origin story and sort of how I came to be who I am. Well, I, If you don't know this already for anyone in the audience, all my keynotes, all my events, I wear a superhero cape that's customized. They're Mm -hmm. all uniforms. They're not costumes. And I really believe that my responsibility in life is to advocate for people who may not be seen in the world, may not have a voice in the world. And so I am always for the underdog because I like the idea of leveling the playing field. And so that is where my space has been. If you look at my trajectory of all my experiences, you will see the work I did in all these different sectors that all represent leveling the playing field. So everyone has a chance to win. Yeah. Mm, I love that so much. (laughs) Well, and I think when you come from that place of that, that's like mission driven purpose. Of course. Yeah. And when you come from that place and then see how that can play out in an authentic way in the world, then I think you're really well positioned kind of for the audience. Obviously you are well positioned to (laughs) to find the space that really fits and that you can serve authentically because exactly. uh, But even just to go back to like the life coach thing, if you're doing it because you want a nomad lifestyle, well, maybe that's not your authentic purpose, right? Like there's nothing mission driven about wanting to be able to travel all the time and not have a home base. Maybe there is. Exactly. I think finding the what and that mission and that like nugget of truth in the midst of it. I also teach people to do podcasts and that's the thing that Mm. I tell them to go after is like, okay, so you want one, that's great. But what's the little changing point that you can go back to the one little nugget of space that you want to teach somebody about or show them in a new way? What's Mm -hmm. that for you? Because Mm -hmm. if you can't identify that, then it's just going to be like you're saying, it's just in the noise. You're out there making the same kind of noise everybody else is making. Correct. Yeah. What else do you see? I mean, a lot of us kind of to kind of go with the rest of this, you're a fifth generation entrepreneur. What else do you see that baby entrepreneurs, maybe like myself or someone that's rising in the, in the coaching industry, what mistakes are we making that we don't even know we're making? I want to talk a little bit about funding because it scares most people to death. It does. We're not told to do funding. We're told like, well, you just make it, save yourself a little severance, then leave when you haven't saved up. But yeah, I mean, exactly all around target funding, which is your book. How do we... How do we look at that differently? So I'm going to bring you back into my world. So if I had a time machine, because I'm an inventor, but we haven't developed that yet. (laughs) But if I did, and I brought you and everyone else back to 2001, you would have found me in Arizona. I was literally sitting on a curb. I remember the lamppost. I was looking above. I saw it. It was drizzling. It was in the evening. And I was sobbing my eyes out like uncontrollably by myself because Five minutes prior, I had just walked out of the bankruptcy court. Mm -hmm. And what most people don't realize is that if you look at why people file bankruptcy, it's one of three reasons, job crisis or loss of a business, health crisis, or the third, which is most popular for women, is a divorce. Mm -hmm. 
That's the reality. And so there I was saying, how do I pick myself up? When you're educated, you have a degree, you happen to know how to manage money, but you're in a crisis. And I remember going back to my apartment and over the next two weeks, it was kind of a fog until I received an envelope in the mail. I can remember it as, as if it was yesterday. It was from Capital One credit card company. And I remember thinking, why are they sending me anything? I just filed bankruptcy. And I opened it up and it was for a credit card for $200. Now I'm going to pause here because when you asked me earlier, was there any fond memory I remembered as a child? The one fond memory that I do remember is I used to play Monopoly all the time. (laughs) all the time. And I am very competitive. So I don't know if you remember or if you've played Monopoly, but there's when you go around the board, as you're trying to collect real estate, you go around, you go to go and you get to collect a certain amount of money as you continue. Do you remember how much it is? (laughs) $200. That's right. (laughs) It was $200. So right there and then I said to myself, I am back in the game. Like I was screaming up and down, Capital One. Oh my God, you believe in me? Because as far as I was concerned, I'm back in the Monopoly game. I'm ready to play. There's going to be real estate happening here. Right. And, And then right after I said that, I said, what if I go on a journey to uncover every funding and resource available to people like me that were educated, passionate, you know, and education could be either formal or informal, passionate and wanted the American dream, but had a crisis happen. That took me on a 15-year journey where I uncovered the variables to figure out how to find money for people. And then it took three years to write the book. So let me go through what people are missing. When you're looking at starting your company, you're always told to go to friends, families, credit cards, and banks. And I'm going to tell you right now, having done this for years, That is never the strategy I go for. Mm. The first thing I would do is I would look at how to build variables because every single person listening to this right now does not realize this, but I'm about to enlighten you. Every variable that you need is already inside of you or in your business. You just don't know it yet. And it is all tied to money. If you don't mind, let's just take an example. Yeah. So let's suppose I am working with a woman entrepreneur startup. And this woman entrepreneur tells me that she is starting her company. She's interested in life coaching. She's based in San Francisco, California. She happens to be interested in coaching clients, but with a spin where maybe she's in coaching parents and autistic kids on communication styles so that she can, you know, better help that alignment and also give parents maybe the opportunity to have a fruitful life with the dynamics they have. That's pretty specific. Mm -hmm. And maybe on top of that, she's got an online communication system in place where maybe there's a, there's a forums and maybe a database in place for that education. That scenario alone can open a world up of funding. And I live in the grant and resource world because my idea is I'd rather have you find free money first before we look at debt, which is loans or equity, which is you giving up a percentage of your company. So in that example, we could look at funds in the startup phase or even in research and development. There are funds tied to that. We can look at funds by location, funds in San Francisco, funds outside San Francisco, in California, funds within the state of California, all tied to your location. We can also look at your mission. So we can find funding tied to autism, funding tied to parenting, funding tied to communication, funding tied to technology. We can look at even funding tied by the government that actually pays for research and development to help solve some of that communication problems related to parents and kids with autism. All of that is ready and available, but without understanding your variables unique to you, or the business, it's very difficult. And then on top of that, we can look at, are you a veteran? Do you have a disability? Are you within a minority? Are you classified as as an LGBTQ business? Anything like that is like additional gold that allows us to go for funding specific for you. Right. 
Mm. And I know in your book, you break down some of those different yes. kind of niches of funding where people can look Absolutely. for things, depending on what those what their variables might be and where they have a match. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Well, and I love too that like a lot of what, as you said, equity or debt, like I think those are the two big things that we think, oh, those are the ways for me to get funding for a right. small business, especially probably also really fueled by Shark Tank, right? Because we of see course. people walk in and give up a percentage of their business to get money to come in. Yes. And then oftentimes yeah. they have to pay it back if you're working with exactly. you're wonderful. <laughs> exactly. Right? Like, so I don't know, how is it or why is it maybe that we don't think about grants and other kind of funding when we're in that kind of startup phase? I think because it's it's been this, you know, very difficult understanding and it really comes down to key words. I like to say that most of us are dialed into Mr. and Mrs. Google mm -hmm. and they're a wonderful couple. And what we do is we visit them often and we key in the word grant and then we get 60 million hits. And after 10 or 20 pages, we try to pull our hair out if we have any. And we don't know why Mr. and Mrs. Google, you know, are not giving us what we need. The reality is, is that the definition of grants can be spoken in many, many ways. I can throw out terminology right now that the majority of listeners have no idea what I'm referring to. I could say grants. I can say SBIR. I can say STTR. I can say forgivable loan. I could say match savings. Most people are saying, what is all this? Well, believe it or not, in the world of grants and resources, there's language to be learned. Right. And if you don't know the language, it's like going to another country. You will never be able to speak it and obtain what you need. Are there funding options for kind of more the solopreneur or somebody that's yes. really small um, yes. and just starting out? Yes. I have found funding sources for marketing, for going to trade shows, for developing websites, for getting business, free business advising in any, anywhere from, you know, SEO to bookkeeping. I have found resources for the development of a feasibility plan. You know, what I want everyone to know is that the myth that the money is, is not there, I'm breaking it down. <laughs> it's got to stop. This yeah. is, I'm over it. Right. Because if I tell you all the money, you would say this is insanity. So in 2001, I had, I was at the time, I did not have employees. I was a solopreneur doing my work and I was invited, funding party, I was invited to apply to purchase my own commercial condominium, which if you've ever purchased your own commercial office, it's a lot of money. You need a minimum of 20% down. You have to show collateral. You have to show that you have great credit. But because I filed bankruptcy, I didn't have the collateral. I didn't have great credit. And the, and guess what? That wasn't a variable needed. What they had asked for was you had to have been in business three years or more. You had to have been based in Oregon, particularly in Portland. You had to have been doing a, like something like that was going to impact the community. And the most important criteria is you had to be a woman, a minority, or an immigrant. And because I qualified, I received an incredible opportunity where I had to only put 6% down on an $800,000 valued office. And my interest has been fixed now, Paula, for 10 years at an interest rate of 0.04%. Percent, not even one percent, right. not even half a percent, point yeah. zero four percent. Where do you get? Nobody gets that. That is free money, like in every single way that I can term it. Yeah, and that's amazing. Like I think most of us who are starting out don't even think that those things are like out there, right? I think is there yeah. that kind of idea that we have to pull ourselves up completely by our bootstraps and that it's going to be really hard and that those opportunities don't really exist for us. And I don't know where that capital S story is coming from. <laughs> but right. I mean, you do have to be smart and think about it a little bit different is what I'm hearing. And I, do you have any thoughts as to why we're kind of went of to this idea I that do. it's so hard? Of course I do. Because who's been lobbying mm -hmm. the finance industry this whole time? You have two major representations. You have the banks. Mm-hmm that lobby this idea. Like, look, and let me just tell you, if you are a lender, I love you. 
But let's just be real. Every single bank will say we support small business. But let's just go into a definition. The definition of small business, according to the Small Business Administration, is 500 employees or less. Right. Welcome to the rules. So if yeah. you think you're a small business as a one person operation and you're coming up against a company who has 499 employees and they're considered a small business, there lies one of the issues. Yes. Right. The second issue is, is that lenders will say they promote small businesses as long as you meet the criteria. Well, the reality is, is that it's all about risk appetite. I like to give the analogy because everybody loves, has had pizza one form or another, that we have this idea that if we take a pizza pie, everybody thinks that the pizza pie should represent one thing, one loan, one equity, one credit card. And I tell everyone that, wait a minute, doesn't a pizza pie have 12 slices? Then we should be having 12 strategies. We should be looking at funding streams that identify 12 different ways to make that pizza pie work. And so I think one of the issues of the banks and the other issue that you brought up is Shark Tank. I love Shark Tank. Many of my <laughs> friends have gone on Shark Tank. It's a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> it's a lot of fun to watch. But let's just be real about Shark Tank. The majority of clients who make it in Shark Tank, first of all, have an IP, intellectual property, which is my background. So they have filed a patent or patent pending. So they have that kind of protection. They also have usability, right, where they've tested it out in the market. And often they have sales. And then last is just the character and the uniqueness of how they present themselves on there. And every single person is vetted, yeah. right? So, you know, it's not like they're showing you the spectrum of everyone, because if they showed you the spectrum, there may be a lot of deals that aren't done. Right. Or business plans that just are not unique in any way. And so we're not ready. An investor, right. right. An investor may not be in, interested at that point. Yet. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so my philosophy is I never, ever judge someone from where they are today. I only judge where they, who they can become. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a beautiful way to start that because obviously everyone starts somewhere. And exactly. if it is back to kind of that, if you're on a life coach journey or a solopreneur journey, this thing that you are right this second is helping lay the groundwork for whatever that, whatever your end game is or wherever you're headed and I don't think any of us, when we start out, exactly know. I would never have guessed that joy would become my platform or right. <laughs> start teaching podcasting classes. Like that was right. never in <laughs> my purview exactly. when I signed up to become a coach. So yeah, I yeah. think that's. I think there's that too, and it's really easy to see people that come onto a Shark Tank or whatever and hear their story and think, "Why can't I do that?" Well, maybe right. you could, but you're just not there yet. Right. And also the other thing I would say is if I took the definition of a superhero, because I play that in everything I do and I'm really serious yeah. about it, is a real superhero in this world is a lobbyist or an advocate. And most of us can't pay for lobbyists. Millions and millions of dollars are set aside for lobbyists to represent legislative changes and influence our financial position in the market. The reality is, is I've worked with senators before because one of the issues that women face is they are not fully collateralized in most places. So they may have the sales, but when it comes to securing things, they don't meet a lot of the loans because they don't have the collateral. Right. That's a really, that's a problem that's much bigger than the Paula or the Kedmus of the world, right? You meet someone lobbying. And in many ways, your superheroes of the world are your advocates, your champions, who I fundamentally believe who can create doors from where there were walls. Right. And so that's a whole different game changer. And I always am looking for my superheroes. If I can't get through, I am thinking, okay, where are my superheroes in that industry or in that in a climate so I can get through and create a door? Because otherwise, I'm going to have a barrier to entry. I won't be able to go through it. Right. Well, and is that something that, does it take a special superpower to find the superhero that has those connections or that ability to break something down for you? Mm -hmm. Or like, how would someone, if you kind of yeah. realize, I wish I could get through this barrier, how do you find those people? You're going to find them usually in, a lot of times they're in service-based industries, right? They are the champions to open doors. So when we're running into a barrier with permitting or legislative or access to capital, you may find them in economic development because 
When you think about economic development, when you think about the role of the Women's Business Center, and I came from that, I used to run the Women's Business Center from SBA, or the Small Business Development Centers, which is mandated through the government, that entire map, roadmap, and landscape is designed to lift up the community by creating jobs, by opening access. And that's why if you look at the society and the nonprofit model, you'll see there's there's representatives that from everything from the Hispanic chamber to the African chamber to the LGBTQ community. And these are your superheroes. These are your advocates. And then within that, they're niched. For me, I'm the superhero for access to funding. But if you needed you needed to find a superhero for employee retention, there you have to look for that. So first decide what do you need? And then I always go to LinkedIn. Just happened today. I am going to be on two TV segments at the end of this month. I will be in Washington, D.C. I really don't know anybody, Paula, but I wanted to do, I don't, I I wanted to do a one hour workshop on on funding in Washington, D.C. I don't have a venue. I don't have anything. So I went on LinkedIn three hours ago and I said, I have a vision. I'd like to do a one hour workshop. It would cost $25 and you get the book and the book is $25. So basically it's free. Mm -hmm. And in three hours, I have a venue secured at an amazing university. Oh, wow. That's the power of finding your superheroes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and putting the intention out there, right? That like, this is what I desire because I think oftentimes we're afraid to even voice that thing. But then once it's out there, people want to co-conspire with you to bring things to life. Yeah, exactly. That's amazing. Oh, that's so cool. (laughs) Um, So I'm going to be at Howard University, which I love. It's a research institution and focused on really supporting, you know, black and African American entrepreneurs and students and perfectly in alignment with the work I do. Yeah. Mm, I love that. That is wonderful. (laughs) Are there other pieces about the entrepreneurial space Mm. or the funding space that really energize you and that you feel like you're not getting, don't get talked about enough? Well, I do want to say that, you know, let's get into the scary world of funding and tell you it's super easy. Yeah. Because my job is to create an opportunity. And this is what I love about play because I'm playful and everywhere I go. When you introduce play into the mind, it's not as scary. When you introduce adventure, it's not as scary. When I tell my clients to, you know, think about what they need, I ask them to do a wish list, indicate everything you would love to have that may cost you money for your business. And then your job is to put it in order of priority. Mm. Now you get to cross out all the things that are not a need. Okay. And so here's the analogy I tell my clients. Everybody likes to play soccer. And when they come into my office, they say, I want to play soccer, Kedma. And I go, great. What do you need to play soccer? And they start with this. This is no joke. They go, well, before I even play soccer, I need a stadium. (laughs) You need a stadium. Yeah. Yeah, I need a stadium. Okay. Well, okay. Let me write that down. You need a stadium. What else do you need? Well, I need a stadium. I want to make sure that we have top of the line uniforms. We have to have world-class training on how to play soccer. We want to have all the advertising. And so I'll let them go through the list. Mm Mm-hmm. And at some point I'll say, Paula, this sounds really good, but my job is to get you to play soccer. And frankly, I don't even care if you have the right soccer shoes or not, because if you're not in the game playing soccer, it doesn't matter what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So I'm really clear about getting in the game. And when I started my company before I bought my office in 2001, you're going to laugh at this, but I have to just tell the audience, I rented do my coaching. It was 150 square feet for $150. And I remember telling the landlord, I don't think I can afford it. So I asked my buddy, John, if if he would rent 75 square feet for $75. Do you know how small 75 square feet is? (laughs) It's tiny. (laughs) Smaller than most bathrooms. (laughs) (laughs) And my landlord came to me and said, now, listen, Miss Kedma, if you can't afford $75, I don't know if you're going to make it in this business. And I remember saying, you know, I'm all about what I need. And right now I just need 75 square feet. Yeah. Well, it's great because it does kind of call into question. I mean, 
what stories and kind of like what things we're telling ourselves, which is probably actually just fear or some other thing that comes up. Like the question of, do you really need a stadium to play soccer? You know, it sounds very similar to one podcasting student that told me, oh no, I need a sound booth in my house. And I'm like, (laughs) wait, do you really need a sound booth? (laughs) I don't have a sound booth. Right. And that's the problem we have is because we have this image problem. We yes. feel like we have to go to that place where we, we showcase that we've made it. But mm-hmm. authenticity is all about showing that, you know, we can still be extremely successful in what we do and still have a hole in the wall experience. Like I'm a New Yorker. The best restaurants are hole in the wall restaurants that have the best food. Yeah. So it's yeah. changing that mindset. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and realizing you can be a professional without all of the outward of appearances of being of a professional. Of course. <laughs> and if anyone decides to stalk me or look at me online, I want you to know that really about 70% of all my dresses I got from Goodwill. <laughs> me too. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Right? That, yeah. That is the best. It's yes. the best, right? I keep telling Goodwill that I have an issue with them because they're not picking up, you know, really successful women entrepreneurs to showcase that we also shop there. Mm-hmm. We do. Right? Yeah. Right. So I love it. Yeah. So that's what I want is I want people in the game and not having this fear that they have to make a lot, especially as a consultant, you know, less than $500, you should be in the game and making money. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Yeah. Well, and I think that's really important that somehow there is that materialist. I mean, we live in this capitalist society where that there is a lot of that, like the expense and the shows of wealth and whatever, like that feels important, but it's not really a necessity to get where you want to go. You nailed it. Yeah. Mm. Well, (laughs) Kedva, your book is Target Funding and it's excellent. And if somebody wants to find that or find out how they could work with you, where can they do that? www.kedmao.com or www.targetfunding.com. And I love LinkedIn. I'm all over LinkedIn. I will link up everything in the show notes so you guys can find it there too. Um, Perfect. If somebody has a big dream that they want to bring into action, how would you say they should start on that Mm. endeavor? Mm. Manifestation is huge. Mm. I'm going to be really honest. Every dream must begin in your thoughts. And this is this I'm giving. Okay. I'm about to give everybody gold. Now, when I give gold, it means please pay extra attention. And so you're going to listen to this gold and say, I know this gold, but knowing this gold and implementing the gold is two different things. Hmm. So the first thing I do is I get very clear on what I will manifest. And then I never doubt it. The problem we see with people when they're looking after that dream is they begin with the manifestation. And then when they don't get the dream, when they think it should come, then they begin to doubt that the dream never is going to come and that it shouldn't have come and that, you know, all this is messed up. The dream for me to do this book was 18 years. Yeah. I don't know a lot of people who wait 18 years for something to manifest. (laughs) Right. All right. I don't. The second thing is, is you take that huge dream. And you create it into little chunks. When you go and have your pizza pie, please, I'm going to assume you're not stuffing that pie in your face at one bite, right? Right. So you're going to take that idea and take that dream and you're going to say, okay, I have 12 slices to this dream. I'm going to start with one slice and I'm going to take one bite. What is that first thing I need to do? And so you begin that way. And for me, the first thing was I had to prove that my model would work. I could not and will never write a book that I don't believe can actually happen in real life. So I had to spend years proving that my my methodology works. That's what happened. So I would encourage you to to do that. And then because you're many of you are coaches, you need to find a coach. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Do Amen. not right, do not do your own therapy. Please. It does not work. I am a coach and I have many coaches who support me in different roles. I have what I call hyper-focused coaching. I have a speaking coach. I have a publicist who coaches me. You know, I have an agent coach. You need to have your coaches surrounding you because you cannot do this alone. Mm, That is so valuable. Yeah. And I think if you see anybody out there that is doing something that you, you know, you're like, oh, I wish I could be like them. It is more likely than not that they 
have a team without <laughs> a doubt. doing that alone. It may without look like a, a solo effort, but it is yeah. not. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a team of probably seven people behind me that all they do is open opportunities for me. And I want to be clear here. We do not have to be skilled in everything. Mm, yeah. You know, I do this example all the time because I am the worst cook you can imagine. My first cake I broiled. My first meal for my husband, I didn't know that you had to, I guess, poke ma- like potatoes to make mashed potatoes. And I remember throwing it in a blender with butter and margarine. I nearly broke the blender. And he came home with chunks of mashed potatoes on his plate and said, honey, I love you, but this is the worst meal I've ever had happen in my entire life. You don't ever have to cook again. So my point being is know where your strength is and outsource everything else. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love it. Well, and so the last question that I ask everyone is sure. what are three ways you can think of to jumpstart joy in your life, in the world, or in other people's lives? Three ways. Mm-hmm. So the first is always gratitude. I wake mm-hmm. up every day and I, I give gratitude every single day. The second is realizing that my joy comes from serving others. I have had for years In my previous vehicle, a license plate logo that said, on loan from God serving humanity. So Mm -hmm. I tell people, hey, I'm on loan right now, guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, here's the deal. (laughs) So I get immense joy in doing that. And the third place I get joy is spending time with actually my most important clients, with which is children. I think we have an obligation to raise kids that feel safe, that can experience happiness, that have permission to imagine, that have permission to be business women. And I spend a lot of my time, you know, helping to coach these wonderful soon to be leaders of the world at any age. My 10 year old can negotiate hand to hand with almost anybody in the business world because I train my kids on how to have that strong confidence, but also know the rules of business. Mm-hmm. That is so amazing. And what a gift. I mean, what a gift to come out knowing I can do this. And I oh. I have full permission to use my imagination all the time. Yes. Yeah, full permission. Yeah. Mm, Kedma, thank you so much thank for coming you. on. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. If you want to find out more about this episode, including links to the things that we've talked about, you can find the show notes at jumpstartyourjoy.com. And you can search for this episode right up there in the right-hand corner of the website. and You'll find it. While you're on the website, I know you're going to want to sign up for my weekly newsletter, which is Three Joyful Things. It's where I take a look and give you guys the behind the scenes of what I'm really thinking about with each episode, including the inspiration, intention, and action, along with the choices that you can make in your own life to bring some of the things that each guest or I share into your everyday life. So it's a lot of fun. You can find the sign up for that off the homepage or within the show notes of every episode. And I would love to connect with you. I hang out a ton on Instagram where my handle is Jumpstart Your Joy. You can also find the Facebook page for this podcast at Jumpstart Your Joy. So I hope you guys will come on back next week. And until then, I hope that your days are filled with so much joy.